הולכים עכשיו לעשות דיון שמדבר על המצב בארצות הברית. פרימן ריין מהחטיבה האחות במפלגת האלטרנטיבה הסוציאליסטית בארצות הברית הולך להציג ניתוח של המצב העכשווי בארצות הברית. בעצם ארצות הברית, אנחנו שומעים הרבה בארץ על טראמפ, אנחנו שומעים הרבה בארץ על טראמפ, אבל המצב שם זה לא רק שטראמפ נבחר ורק הימין עולה וכולי, יש המון התארגנויות, מחאות והזדמנויות פוליטיות לשמאל הסוציאליסטי בארצות הברית. בואו ניתן פשוט לפרימן ריין להמשיך ולספר. So before I begin, I'd like to say that uh, first I'm, I'm deeply grateful to have the opportunity to come here uh, and share news and analysis of the explosive developments and opportunities in New York society. Uh, but I'm even more grateful to come to this, this part of the world and learn from all of you as well at this conference. Uh, we in Socialist Alternative and the CWI are proud to be part of and fighting to strengthen an international organization. In our view, we will not be able to win the promise of a socialist future without understanding that socialism must be international. Uh, I, I really look forward to returning to the US and sharing everything that I've learned here uh, and the heroic traditions of struggle of the working class I've heard about at this conference. So I just wanted to say thank you. I'll be attempting to cover a broad range of political features in US society today. Uh, but before I begin, let me just explain a little bit what socialist alternative is and some of the, the history of us in the US. Uh, we've emerged in recent years as one of the leading forces on the far left in the U.S. Uh, this has been through several avenues, partly through that that we re-elected and, uh, uh, you know, elected and re-elected Shama Sawant, who's a Marxist and member of our organization, to the Seattle City Council in 2013 and again in 2015. Uh, we ran her independent of the Democratic Party as a, you know, an open member of our organization uh, with no money from big business, and she received over 100,000 votes in 2013. And this victory, anticipated by uh, several years, really the rising popularity of socialist ideas, the explosive campaign of Bernie Sanders, uh, and the rapid growth of the DSA, which is the Democratic Socialists of America, uh, all of which I'll discuss in this in introduction. Through her position, we were able to pass the first $15 minimum wage in a major city in the US in early 2014. And this then spread to, to pass in many other cities and states as well, including the, the whole states of New York and California. Uh, and after Trump was elected, we were some of the first to call protests on the streets with our organization bringing uh, 50,000 uh, into the streets the day after his election. So we seek to build a Trotskyist revolutionary political party which develops leaders in working class struggle in trade unions and in universities and, and in the street. And at the same time, due, the, due to the uh, historically weak forces of the left in the US, we must simultaneously work to push for the development of mass organizations of workers newly emerging into struggle with the goal of helping develop the creation of a new mass workers party independent of corporate power, which has never existed in the US. We've never had a slowdown. Okay. A, a new mass worker party, uh, that it, we, we've never had a labor party or anything like it in the US. We've only had capitalist uh, parties. So I'm afraid I won't be able to offer a very long-term picture of where things are heading in the U.S. situation because political instability in the U.S. has led to a rapidly shifting situation. In our organization, we are forced to draw up analysis of where things will head in the range of months uh, and sometimes weeks rather than years. Uh, and this is demonstrated clearly by just the rapid developments in the last 24 hours around Trump's attempted nomination of Brett Kavanaugh, who appears to be a serial rapist uh, to the Supreme Court. Um, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, who says that she was sexually assaulted by this judge, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, when they were in high school, just gave powerful testimony live yesterday while millions of people around the world watched. And Kavanaugh, uh, his response was a, a furious and really pathetic display of wounded macho anger as he denied absolutely everything that happened. Uh, and in spite of the mass mood of anger rising in the US, especially among women in response to this, the Senate looked as though they were going to go forward with his nomination. Uh, but one GOP, uh, the Republican senator, uh, joined the call actually for an investigation by the FBI. Uh, so that's going to happen this week. And we don't know what the results of this will be, but it's important to note that the US midterm elections are only a little bit more than a month away. Uh, and Trump is desperately trying to confirm this judge
because it's a, it's a lifetime appointment. Once he's on, they just stay on until they retire. Uh, or, you know, they stay until they're 90 years old sometimes to the Supreme Court. Uh, because uh, if they, they're likely to lose, actually, the Republican majority in Congress, that's going to make it easier for him to appoint this, this judge. It's important to also, though, understand that if Kavanaugh is confirmed, uh, we could see mass explosions of anger in the streets on a level we haven't uh, seen before recently. Perhaps we will see a women's march uh, just as big as the three million we saw last year. Because women understand that Kavanaugh will likely vote to ban abortion access in the US, and they refuse to go back to that ter terrible period in history. But we must also understand that if the Democratic Party seizes control of Congress in the upcoming elections, Trump will likely still be able to confirm a very right-wing judge, just not as right-wing as Kavanaugh. Because, for example, there is even one Democrat right now who plans to vote for Brett Kavanaugh. So it's just uh, it's a matter of degrees. That's the situation as it develops right now, but I'd like to use my introduction to this discussion to start a little earlier uh, and sketch a broad picture of a few key features in US history that have led to where we are today and hopefully give indications of where things are likely to develop from here. So the first piece of the puzzle in the political instability we see in the U.S. is the, the long-term decline of the, the U.S. economy. While some politicians on the center-left uh, argue for a return to the closest period the U.S. has had to social democracy, namely uh, the uh, period after World War II, that period is never going to come back. Decades of brutal cuts to social services, welfare, tax cuts for the rich, uh, and skyrocketing prices for housing and college tuition have further cemented the, the class division. And this all became far sharper in the 2007-2008 financial crisis, which led to millions of foreclosures and evictions from uh, people's homes, and provided the political basis for a shock campaign against unions and social services in the name of shrinking the tax, uh, the, the deficit. Despite the supermajority, the Democratic Party, uh, the namely Liberal Party, and from 2008 to 2010, <clears throat> President Obama failed to use uh, this and reverse this process by taxing the rich and instead bailed out the banks whose predatory practices helped develop the crisis in the first place. So today, US student debt stands at $1.5 trillion. Union density in the public sector is 35%, and in the private sector, it's only 6%. There's not one neighborhood in the entire United States where a minimum wage worker can afford a, a two-bedroom apartment for a family. And there's an understanding among the working class that their children uh, and youth today will be worse off economically than their, their parents were. In Flint, Michigan, it's an old industrial town with a mostly African-American population. The water infrastructure has decayed so badly that thousands and thousands of children uh, in this city have been inflicted with permanent brain damage due to dangerous levels of lead in the water. Uh, and they're forced to buy bottled water for all purposes, including bathing. They're not given any money to do this with. Uh, and this hasn't been addressed for over four years. So despite what the, the right-wing trumpets about the highest ever cap of the US stock market, in reality, this is based on quicksand. There has really been no essential recovery from the crash in 0708 for working people. And while unemployment is nominally very low, many have given up looking for work and are therefore not counted. Uh, while well, many others work two to three jobs to get by. Even the finance and business journals are beginning to ring the alarm bells in the economy, declaring that the next financial crash is coming, and it could be, uh, in quotes, worse than the Great Depression. <clears throat> All of this, however, has not been received without a fight back. The key struggles during the Obama administration began first with the movement of Occupy Wall Street in 2011, after a few years of sort of shock from the working class post-recession. <clears throat> Thousands of people participated in long-term occupations in public parks and cities all across the U.S., and a new conversation about class developed for the first time since the triumphalist, uh, capitalist uh, me messaging after the fall of the Soviet Union. Millions of Americans gained a new vocabulary, chanting, we are the 99%, and articles began to pour out examining wealth inequality in the U.S., which has developed to the point that the top 1% of the rich in the U.S. own as much wealth as every other person in the US combined. Despite this new beginning of early class consciousness, though, it didn't generally coalesce into new workers' organizations or mass organizations because of the low, still political level of the US left. And at this time, uh, anarchist organizing methods really dominated Occupy Wall Street. We saw 
you know, every initiative was undertaken simultaneously. There was no political or organizational cohesion binding them. Uh, and you know, they occupied public spaces, but nothing else really happened um, except for a, sort of an imprint on messaging and consciousness. But many uh, new young activists learned important lessons from this, and some drew Marxist conclusions, and we recruited uh, very well out of this. The other key fight back during the Obama administration, uh, which is still having an impact, was the explosive movement against police brutality, united around the slogan, Black Lives Matter. After a, a young, unarmed black man, Michael Brown, was shot by the police in Ferguson, Missouri, it's a small suburb, uh, and uh, he was shot on suspicion of petty theft from a gas station, the police left his body in the street for four hours. And this contradiction between uh, what people saw there, the growing police violence against uh, black communities, as well as their, the growing exposure of it through social media, and the hope and ex expectations that were generated for the black community after the victory of Obama in uh, the US, created a movement that has proved thus far uh, impossible to fully put down. Tens of thousands protested in cities across the US, they blocked highways, they occupied streets, and there were many new upticks of struggle as more and more young uh, black people were murdered by the police, including several in Seattle, uh, where I live. There was a mass uprising in Baltimore in 2015 after a man named Freddie Gray mysteriously died in police custody. And all of these protests faced intense militarized policing. You had armored police tanks in the streets in Ferguson. You had police snipers on rooftops and even small fascist organizations mobilized to these uprising uh, with, with you know, semi-automatic weapons to, uh, in their words, protect private property during these demonstrations. Some of the original organizers in the Ferguson protests have disappeared. <clears throat> and it's important to note that all this police repression under, uh, occurred under the presidency of Obama, as well as uh, uh, this woman named Loretta Lynch. She was the first black woman to be attorney general. And while the police killings haven't stopped, uh, the movement has diminished somewhat, with momentum fading especially under the Trump administration as the movement failed to win any substantial uh, concrete reforms un under Obama. And so there's been a reevaluation of tactics by the movement. Uh, and some radical black organizations have developed out of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, especially at the city by city level. There's no like national uh, organization. Many have turned towards electoral politics, uh, sometimes, although rarely, choosing to stand outside the two major parties and run as independents, which we really support. And we saw this with a close race for mayor in Seattle, where Black Lives Matter activist Nikita Oliver nearly won as an independent, uh, taking no corporate money for her campaign as well. Socialist Alternative actively supported and engaged in this campaign. And while the Black Lives Matter movement is not strong at the moment, we can be sure that the movement for black liberation in the US will rise and rise again as long as capitalism and racism exist. However, in many ways, the biggest fight back against austerity so far in the US came in the form of the Bernie Sanders president uh, campaign for president in 2016. And in order to understand why so many millions rallied behind Bernie Sanders, we need to look at him in contrast to what else was on offer. On one hand, you had the Republican Party uh, primary, and it resembled a circus, really, which with uh, each performer seeking to outcompete one another with their vile words and right-wing policies. On the other, for years before the election, it was clear that Hillary Clinton was the chosen favorite of the establishment. She was Secretary of State under Obama, and had pr proven her devotion to Wall Street uh, and imperialism over many years. Um, and from the capitalist's perspective, she, she had a, her potential status as the first woman president, which would of course be a momentous achievement, and her ability to portray herself as a, really a champion of women and also the black community, uh, which I, I, for reasons I, it's hard to get into right now, it seemed to indicate that she had nearly already won the presidency. And by contrast, Bernie Sanders really was an unlikely rallying point. He is one of the oldest members of the Senate, and he spent little time in front of the cameras of the mainstream media. But he was the only independent in the Senate, and his record seemed really strong. Where Clinton had mountains of terrible statements and positions in her past, <clears throat> such as the time she referred to impoverished uh, black youth as, quote, super predators with no conscience who needed to be brought to heel, 
There were many old videos and photos of Bernie speaking out against war and racism and facing arrest of protest actions. Most importantly, he called himself a socialist, and he rallied against the, the billionaire class. One of the slogans for his presidency uh, was called uh, a political revolution against the billionaire class. That's what he wanted his campaign to represent. And for U.S. youth, when, uh, when they're polled in recent years, they've expressed that a uh, you know, majority of them prefer socialism to capitalism, at least with their understanding of it. Uh, and really, for, for them, this, this campaign was a polit political awakening like no other. From the perspective of socialist alternative, it was extremely important for us to engage in this mass movement while also acknowledging the limitations of Sanders' politics. While he called himself a socialist, <clears throat> the substance of his politics actually had more in common with European social democracy, or Franklin uh, Roosevelt. He was the president who organized the New Deal, which was a mass compromise between militant industrial unions and the ruling class, and this reformed and saved capitalism in the US for decades. He did not resemble someone like Eugene Debs, the independent socialist who ran for president from prison in uh, 1920. <clears throat> He had a mixed record on U.S. imperialism, although he said in a major national debate uh, with Clinton that, unlike her, he was proud to have not received the endorsement of Henry Kissinger, who was the vicious architect of the U.S. Cold War, I'm sure many of you know. So Socialist Alternative was unique, actually, on the Marxist U.S. left in our orientation to his campaign. Unlike other Marxist organizations who prefer to stand aside and ensure that everyone they spoke to understood that he wasn't uh, a real Marxist, um, we went to his rallies and engaged with thousands of his supporters through an organization we launched called Movement for Bernie, discussing with them the, uh, the possibility of a new mass left party in the U.S. and our view that a mass movement in the streets would be needed to carry through any of his major <coughs> left-wing policies. Though he eventually endorsed Clinton and dropped out of the race, as we predicted, we nevertheless uh, collected 130,000 signatures calling on Bernie to keep, run keep running as an independent organized actually a walkout in the Democratic Party convention of a portion of Sanders' delegates. But then everything changed with the election of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, this is a man who shrugged up accusations of sexual assault even when he was caught bragging about it on video. He used vicious stories during his campaign comparing Syrian refugees to, to treacherous snakes who would be terrorists by their very nature. And he called for deporting millions of migrants and refugees. Before we look at how things have developed since his election, it's important to examine what forces led to his victory and what that indicates for a strategy that's uh, needed to defeat him. Many on the left declared that with Trump's victory, we were now living in a fascist or soon to be fascist state. And in Socialist Alternative, we think that's actually a strong mischaracterization of the class forces in US society. His calls to deport millions, the, the spike in violent hate crimes after his election, and the emboldening of genuine fascist forces in the US after his election raises the alarm. It's, it's understandable to uh, why people said this. But for us as Marxists, fascism is not just about vile words from right-wing forces. We must also take into account the ability of those forces to actually carry through their promises and analyze the balance of class forces. For us, fascism is the organized and physical destruction of workers' organizations and of workers' democracy. And the U.S. ruling class at this stage really sees any developments in that direction as far too risky for their interests. Because the U.S. working class would respond with unstoppable force at this stage if something like that was really presented. And I think uh, you'll be able to see this later. I'm going to speak about the successful mass anti-fascist demonstrations in the U.S. <clears throat> Fascism for us also means that a mass layer of the population is willing to support and even move into action to support some of these, these right-wing ideas. In the US, we actually see the opposite of this. What has really fueled Trump's victory was his appearance as an anti-establishment figure. Many workers voted for him as a way to punish the elites, and uh, in this way, it's, it's similar to Brexit, actually. Trump, uh, you know, you see what he says in the media, and it's, it's really vile. What he says at his rallies, actually, uh, he, he said all that bad stuff, but he also made very interesting statements. He said that he would uh, drain the swamp, the, what, what, referring to disposing of the political insiders in the, in the system. And he even promised to turn the Republican Party into a workers' party. It, yeah, it sounds ridiculous, right? 
With this kind of rhetoric, it's important to understand that Trump's victory was not purely a victory for his right-wing ideas, but, but also, and we would argue most of all, a rejection and disgust with the, the stale neoliberalism, the centrist ideas represented by Clinton. After Trump's victory, though, uh, a, a, fa a phrase popped up in some layers of youth and workers, which was that uh, Bernie, he would have won. And indeed, many polls indicated that Bernie, if he was pitted against Trump, could have actually beat him in a landslide. In many of the states where Trump won against Clinton, Bernie Sanders actually won decisively in the Democratic Party primary. And this indicates to us that it is, it is absolutely possible to win many voters who supported Trump over to class consciousness, although it will take skillful work and really requires the development of a mass left party that can stand against both the racism and bigotry of Trump while simultaneously addressing the economic and legitimate concerns to which the Democratic Party really said nothing. There were protests in many US cities uh, immediately upon Trump's election. However, these were really uh, only flashpoints before the explosive entrance of the new US women's movement. On the day of Trump's inauguration, over three million marched in the US alone, with many more around the world, under the banner of the Women's March. They stood against his policies and against his misogyny most of all. It was actually the largest protest so far in US history. And this was followed just one week later by a mass and former militant occupation of US airports as some refugees and Muslims were suddenly uh, detained at airports. And some of these protests were actually effective in getting detainees released. And in a few cities, including Seattle, the airports were actually shut down for a few hours to the point that flights were diverted to different cities. This prompted, this, this protest <coughs> prompted federal judges to declare the sudden ban uh, and uh, detentions illegal. And it was essentially a victory for the movement, although Trump was able to override this ban at a later point uh, in the year during a lower point of struggle. 2017, the year after his election, it was filled with protests. It, it seemed as though there were mass marches every few weeks in the spring. Some with a strong working class character, such as the Women's March, uh, and also demonstrations on May Day, and others with a more middle class uh, liberal character as well, such as uh, marches, mass marches, tens of thousands of people in defense of things like uh, science, just as a concept. Um, and another that would call on Trump to release his tax returns. Taking their cues from the Democratic Party establishment, you know, I, I want to be clear that these protests were uh, fantastic and, and huge, uh, but they had, a, they had a different character too. Some protesters here would carry signs accusing Trump of being a communist, uh, assuming that because uh, Putin likes him, that means that he's a, an agent of the KGB. They seem, they seem to forget the Soviet Union fell 30 years ago. <laughs> um, the summer of 2017, uh, it was characterized by a, a quickly radicalizing discussion around Trump's attempts to repeal Obamacare, the, the health care system that Obama had enacted during his administration. In key unions, such as the National Nurses Union, they organized demonstrations against this, against this and in, in contrast to Trump's proposal to take the already pretty corporate-friendly Obamacare system and make it much worse, the nurses began calling for something altogether, which was a universal health care system. Uh, and in California, the nurses actually campaigned for the Democratic Party supermajority that they enjoy to create a statewide universal health care system that California has an economy the size of France. There's no reason they couldn't do this. Um, and they even politically attacked a Democratic Party insider who threw away the legislation uh, uh, of this, this health care system. And this was quite impressive politically from the nurses because in the US, the unions have just very close ties with the Democratic Party they mutually reinforce each other's opportunism. <clears throat> I must also address the far-right rally in Charlottesville in August 2017. Uh, hundreds of far-right forces and fascist forces gathered for a Unite the Right rally in the state of Virginia, and they included people like David Duke, who was the former head of the KKK, uh, and Richard Spencer, who's a new and upcoming fascist in the US. Uh, he's an outspoken white nationalist. He seems determined to take David Duke's place as the polite face of fascist politics. And here, the far right was outnumbered by counter-protesters, not that much, maybe three to one. Uh, the people across the country were shocked by the image of hundreds of young white men holding torches and chanting things like White Lives Matter, in contrast to the Black Lives Matter movement, and even things like uh, Jews will not replace us. 
<clears throat> and in the frenzy of this, left-wing protesters were surrounded and beaten by fascist forces. And tragically, a young woman named Heather uh, Heyer, she was killed by a far-right uh, protester who drove a car at really high speeds into the crowd. In response to all this, Trump uh, claimed that there were, there were good people there, referring to the far-right protesters, and said that really there was violence on both sides. But this was swiftly met with condemnation, even by some Republicans. Uh, and a week later, in contrast to the few hundred far right in Charlottesville, 40,000 people marched in Boston, outnumbering a group of about 40 uh, far right protesters by a margin of 1,000 to 1. Uh, I was in San Francisco at this time <clears throat> of the Boston protest, and Socialist Alternative, along with other Marxist forces, students and community organizations, as well as a few key unions, were all uh, able to uh, organize a solidarity demonstration of about 3,000 against far-right protesters who were coming to harass people in Berkeley, California, throughout the previous year. And after all of this, uh, the far-right, you know, it's still bigger than it was before Trump, especially online, uh, than it has been in many years, but their ascendancy was really cut short by this mass anti-fascist mood. Richard Spencer, the person I mentioned in Charlottesville, he recently declared he was afraid to even show his face in public anymore, and he couldn't organize demonstrations for fear of anti-fascist protesters, especially after a video went viral of him being uh, punched in the face by a protester. Uh, it prompted hashtags like uh, Punch Richard Spencer, and there was even a mainstream debate in the New York Times about whether it's ethical to punch neo-Nazis. Uh, so it was really it was quite mainstream, actually. It was strange. In this period, fascist forces had tried to flex their muscles, and overall they were decisively driven back into their, their own safe spaces by mass numbers of working people in the street. Uh, a mood of outrage online, uh, and even rejections uh, by large portions of the capitalist establishment. And I think this helps to clearly show that while their confidence and potential for recruitment has grown since Trump, it's very far from having mass appeal. And at the same time as was uh, well discussed in yesterday's workshop on fighting the far right with uh, Amar. As long as we live under capitalism, there will be economic and political crises, and the left's failure to put forward a viable socialist alternative will give space to the right wing, uh, establishment, populist, or fascist, <clears throat> each with their varying degrees of anti-establishment posturing to pretend they offer a way forward. In October 2017, and just another couple months later, a new stage of the women's movement developed. It was the hashtag Me Too movement. After a, a black woman, Tarana Burke, shared her experiences of sexual assault online, it prompted millions of women, uh, gender non-conforming people, and some men as well, around the world to declare hashtag Me Too, sharing their experiences with sexual assault and harassment. And while this outpouring started from the bottom, it initially only claimed victories at the top of society, mostly in Hollywood. The, after the now infamous director, Harvey Weinstein, faced several sexual assault accusations, Dozens of other Hollywood celebrities and even some politicians, including Democratic Party favorite Al Franken, began to face sexual assault accusations, some with video and photographic evidence. And the importance of this movement cannot be underestimated at this stage. It breathed new life into the anti-Trump movement, given that Trump himself has bragged about sexual assault. After all, if senators and congressmen who have resigned uh, over accusations, how can someone like Trump just be untouched by all this? There was 19 women who have accused Trump of sexual assault, actually. <clears throat> Even in recent weeks, actually, uh, the Me Too movement has begun to show itself in the labor movement. Uh, workers in hundreds of McDonald's restaurants last week went on strike, protesting sexual harassment at work, citing the Me Too movement. This is a very important development uh, because it brings this political phenomenon into the living struggle on the ground uh, in the labor movement will be really necessary to uh, really win the key demands of the Me Too, Me Too movement, such as the defense of abortion rights. And it helped to set the stage for the developments with the Brett Kavanaugh nomination I addressed earlier. So there's really a growing contradiction between the militancy and anger in the women's movement and the actions of the Democratic Party establishment who claims to represent them. The Democratic Party is adjusting and responding to this anger, it's, but they're doing it far more slowly than the anger is developing uh, in the mass consciousness. Uh, and so their actions are beginning to look quite insufficient and underwhelming. If they fail to take decisive action now against Kavanaugh, and especially if they fail upon taking Congress in the midterm elections, it will give a sharp burst of fuel in the effort to build independent working class politics in the US. <clears throat> 
So while I've described many mass protests against the Trump administration just in 2017, and some victories, it is important to understand too that this movement has, has grown and, and also shrunk at different times. Trump has been able to get away with brutal right-wing policies. He managed to push through one of the biggest tax cuts in US history, which corporations have mostly spent on stock buybacks. It was trillions of dollars. And in fact, during the whirlwind recently of the Kavanaugh nomination, part of Congress has passed another $3.6 trillion worth of tax cuts for the rich over the next 20 years. They try and do everything at once. He threatens to tear up the Iran deal, uh, provoking new and potentially explosive instability in the Middle East. And this has only been aided by his provocative and dangerous decision to move the US Embassy to Jerusalem, uh, which is the impact of which has been made very clear at this, this conference. In one of the most stark examples, he has been separating thousands of immigrant families, uh, detaining children as young as a few months old from their parents, which actually creates permanent psychological trauma for them. Some of these children have even described being locked in dark rooms for many hours, facing beatings and even sexual assault. Hundreds of them are missing. We just don't know where they, where they went, uh, the government says. And this horror uh, has provoked mass outrage, uh, but only relatively small protest, actually, compared to other actions during his administration. And we need to look at why. It's, it's partly due to protest fatigue, the sense that we keep going out and nothing really happens. Trump isn't, isn't uh, thrown out. But it's also due to the hope that many workers are placing in the upcoming midterm elections to put a check on Trump. But we need to also ask ourselves, is this a realistic hope that the midterm elections will change things? And that depends on who is brought in, right? So since Trump's election, there's been a strange coalition of centrist Democrats, the mainstream media, and even right-wing figures like John McCain and Henry Kissinger, who are now all dubbed to be part of what is called the, the resistance uh, against Trump. This loosely defined coalition opposes Trump not with left-wing demands or, or workers' democracy, but by championing a return to normal capitalist society. What this means, really, is a return to austerity, war, and skyrocketing wealth inequality. The one difference being a, a civil tone and no rants on Twitter. So this resistance, uh, it also saves their most poisonous contempt, actually, for the left arguing that it was forces like Bernie Sanders and young socialists who criticized Hillary Clinton who were responsible for the election of Trump because they didn't come out and vote for, uh, for Clinton. And that's actually not true, but uh, many workers did stay home uh, as they do in every election, actually. These people appear to have learned no lessons at all from the 2016 election. It was <coughs> this brand of politics that, you know, it, if you look at the slogans between Hillary Clinton and Trump, Trump said, make America great again. Hillary Clinton said, America is already great, right? And what that says to people is that their concerns, the poverty they experience, it just doesn't exist. It's that kind of politics that got us here. Uh, it was by alienating the working class to the point that they either abstained from the election or they voted for Trump as an anti-establishment force in their view. And by and large, this is the, again the kind of politics the Democrats are bringing to the midterms. This is not an inspiring message. But the, the mood to oppose and restrain Trump is so high, especially now with the Supreme Court nomination, that it may push the Democrats into majorities in the House and even the Senate, although the Senate is less likely. While the vast majority of Democrats are running for office this year are continuing to bring forward austerity, uh, there are a few exceptions. There is a savvy uh, and skilled wing of the party that is attempting to brand the Democratic Party as one that will fight Trump and stand up for left-wing demands. This is represented by such forces as Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, and Cory Booker, who say they'll fight, uh, they'll fight for things like universal health care, but they also, at the same time, have not renounced any corporate money from the for-profit health care system. And that's the, it's the same dynamic in all of their demands. By and large, the, what they're really doing is running an effective messaging campaign, but they do not represent a serious fight for any work left-wing demands or to really fight Trump. Further to the left, uh, there are a few politicians running in the Democratic Party who, who really, they genuinely come from grassroots movements. Uh, they're rejecting corporate money and they're fighting for bold left-wing demands. The most high-profile uh, figure here was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She's a young Puerto Rican member of the DSA who uh, won a shocking victory in the Democratic Party primary in New York City uh, for the House of Representatives. And she did this against one of the most powerful figures in the Democratic Party, uh, a man named Joe Crowley. This man was set to become the leader of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives nationally, but he lost to a 27-year-old woman with no experience in politics, and it's, it's incredible. 
Ocasio-Cortez electrified her district uh, politically and, and subsequently the whole nation by fighting for a strong platform. It was even more left-wing than Bernie's platform. She called for a cancellation of student debt, for universal health care, and, and really spoke out quite sharply against US imperialism. Another example of this kind of politician is Julia Salazar, who's even farther to the left than Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, she recently won a race for a state representative of New York. It's a smaller position, but still significant. Uh, and she calls herself a socialist, and she's, she's really a, a very genuine figure. And I, I, I should have made clear that Ocasio-Cortez has also called herself a, a socialist at points. Well, she's less clear about it than Salazar. <clears throat> While we would have preferred that Salazar and Ocasio-Cortez ran outside of the Democratic Party as independents, they are not part of the Democratic Party in a very enthusiastic way. They do not have strong ties to the party or have, seem to have much faith in it, but they don't see any, any other stage, uh, any, any other route at this stage, and hope perhaps that their runs will even set the ground for the development of independent politics. With Bernie Sanders, how does he fit into this? You know, the left debates whether he's more a part of the layer of Democratic Party politicians like Elizabeth Warren and this left wing of party insiders or the more insurgent uh, grassroots layers like Ocasio-Cortez. It's not really clear. In reality, he's somewhere in between them. The organization between Ocasio-Cortez and Salazar, the Democratic Socialist of America, or DSA, it really represents one of the, the best developments of the Trump era. Uh, and it's gone through rapid changes, so I'd like to address that now. This organization was founded in the 1960s, and it was founded as an explicitly anti-communist, actually, social democratic force. Before the Bernie Sanders campaign, all, almost all of its members existed only on paper or like an email list. And the, actually the average age of member was 68. But the Bernie Sanders campaign helped to shape and invigorate the, the frustrations of a whole generation of youth who had grown up with the reality of the financial crash. Bernie could have channeled this into the formation of a new party, which could have gained at least 100,000 people just immediately on the day he launched it. But he didn't call for this. He endorsed Hillary Clinton instead. So the best layers of the youth he, he excited, they had to do something, right? And it was not inevitable that DSA was the organization these people joined. But the reason is, is that Bernie identified as a democratic socialist, and while he wasn't formally with DSA, you know, this helped to identify DSA with Bernie. They were the democratic socialists of America. And there was also a very low barrier to entry. Uh, to join DSA, you just pay a one-time uh, dues payment uh, annually. It's very, it's like, uh, 30 shekels or something. <clears throat> After Trump was elected, thousands and thousands of people flowed into, the, uh, into DSA, transforming it from what was essentially an email list into now the third biggest socialist organization in US history. It now has 50,000 members, uh, and many chapters around the country with sometimes hundreds of active members in these cities, and it's, it's, uh, it's a very lively place. And this is a really exciting development, but there's also a few, a few uh, key features to understand. DSA is what we would call politically a big tent. Anyone can join, unless you are explicitly like a right-wing right, right -wing party person. What this means is that DSA has liberals, social democrats, uh, anarchists, Stalinists, Maoists, you know, and <laughs> the left at large, anything you can think of. I think the average member, you could say, is closest politically to someone like Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, but many factions inside DF, uh, DSA has, have developed since their initial growth, and some have developed really quite sharp Marxist politics, actually. We're, we're discussing with them uh, frequently. All these people are joined are generally very young, and they're coming into socialist organizing with little to no experience at all. And this means that while they're a relatively large force in U.S. socialist politics, <clears throat> much of their time at meetings is spent debating rules, establishing just the most basic procedures of how the organization runs. They're reinventing it as they join. There's no cohesion politically. Uh, you know, one chapter may be running someone for political office with, with strong political ideas and grassroots funding. That's really good. But at the same time, a significant portion of that chapter is devoting itself to volunteering in public parks or even just going to the gym as like a socialist club. Like a, and there's nothing wrong with that, uh, but with such limited resources, they could really have a much bigger impact if they could coordinate and prioritize what they do. Uh, there was an example in Seattle, like they, they ran a pretty incredible candidate and on the biggest day of door knocking, like this was like the day the election was gonna be made, half of their active members were uh, landscaping in a public park, it was, it was strange. <laughs> <laughs> they think that's, you know, that's, that's how we build socialism, right? So there's a lot of ideas. 
Um, in addition to their new members and experience, most of them are coming from the universities at this stage. But they are trying to build stronger relations with the labor movement and recruit more working class members. So that's good. How do, how do Marxists engage with DSA? Well, because of DSA's anti-communist roots nationally, uh, they actually have a ban on anyone who is part of a democratic centralist organization uh, joining them. Uh, and democratic centralism is an organizing method many uh, Marxist organizations use. So this means that many Marxists are prevented from joining them. Uh, however, due to our success in building friendly relations with some of the chapters of DSA, these, uh, some of these chapters have lifted that ban and in Seattle, a few of our members have joined DSA uh, in discussion with the chapter's leadership in order to work together more closely. We hope to organize together and win victories for our class and also engage in the conversation around the development of Marxist politics in the DSA. Of course, we're also very happy to work with DSA outside of the organization, uh, and we've done that many times so far, collaborating on many events and campaigns. Um, I'm running out of time, but the, the explosive growth in the DSA, is, it's not the only exciting development in the US left, uh, because the giant of the US labor movement is beginning potentially to lift its head uh, again. The labor movement has faced vicious attacks now for decades, uh, but especially in the last eight years in the US. In 2010, the governor of Wisconsin, a uh, state in the US, passed a bill that established what he called uh, the right to work uh, for public sector unions. And what this means is that public sector unions cannot collect dues from, uh, from non-members who benefit from the negotiated contracts. And that's, that's really crucial for these unions. <clears throat> really, it's this, this law is a gift to scabs and the bosses uh, and their messaging. So some on the left dub this bill not right to work, but the right to work for less. And in Wisconsin, this was met actually by a tremendous general strike of public sector workers. And we saw protests of 100,000 people in the state capitol, as well as a multi-day uh, occupation of that capitol. Unfortunately, this movement was not successful in stopping the bill due to maneuvering by the Democratic Party, which I don't have time to detail. Since then, the labor movement has been in free fall for many years. Uh, this year, the Supreme Court passed a law called the, the Janus case. This essentially uh, made the entire country have this right to work uh, bill for public sector unions. And what it, it's, it's a death blow uh, is how it has been, you know, it, really how it's been framed, and also you know, it's, it's a severe, really severe blow to the labor movement in the US. But the major unions just did, they did nothing to oppose it. There were no protests, there were no strikes, no mobilizations, there was absolutely nothing. It seemed that they were just accepting their fate, uh, and they focused their efforts on preparing to try and live under this new reality. In spite of all these defeats, however, we've seen something really incredible this year. Uh, beginning in West Virginia, uh, and subsequently spreading to five states, teachers went on strikes, and some of them were wildcat strikes. These are states, uh, many of which have actually already been living with the right to work, this, this uh, law, the Janus Cass case, uh, passed. They've been living with it for years now, and some of them didn't even have <coughs> teachers unions. They were organizing on Facebook. Teachers have been facing extreme cuts in recent years in the US. Uh, some teachers are working one or even two additional jobs on top of their 40 hours uh, as teachers. They host online fundraisers to pay for pencils for their classes because there's no supplies in the school. And in West Virginia, actually, the state, they propose to give teachers uh, tracking wristbands that would determine how much they exercised per month. They had to wear it. They were, it was proposed they would wear it 24-7, all day, all night. And based, based on how much they exercised and moved, it would determine how much they had to pay for their insurance, their health insurance. It's, it's like a, you know, Orwellian. Um, this was just intolerable to people. And in West Virginia, this was a state that voted really heavily for Trump, uh, but also Bernie Sanders in the primary. They occupied the state capitol and stopped the cuts, and they won a 5% wage increase. In Arizona, we saw the same thing. Uh, teachers organized, uh, and they won a 20% wage increase. And you know, in the U.S., like the labor movement has seen just no victories for many years, and so this this is a, a really a big turning point. These people, the teachers, were uh, developing on they were uh, organizing online, but they also were developing local assemblies and meeting up uh, in person. In some states, in the unions uh, where they, there even were teachers' unions, uh, real anger developed towards the leadership because you know the t uh, unions' leadership was just coordinating directly with the government that was trying to cut things. <clears throat> um, 
So not every state that went on strike with the teachers, they won their demands, but it's just we haven't seen anything like this. We haven't seen a multi-state wildcat strike or anything like it in, in decades in the US. And this really represents as well the development of action in other industries. Uh, and for the first time in years, union membership is growing in some industries in the US, as youth especially are joining the labor movement in much higher rates uh, in the last few years than any other demographic. And there was the possibility, uh, I looked quite certain for a moment and then it was stopped, uh, of a strike in the supplies transportation company, UPS, of 240,000 workers. This would have affected 6% of the entire US economy. And as I mentioned earlier, we have hundreds of McDonald's franchises going on strike right now to protest sexual harassment in the workplace. Also happening right now uh, in the US, thousands and thousands of steel workers are on strike in Pittsburgh because of the explosive growth of stock prices for the steel industry as a result of Trump's trade war. They feel as though they've lived through the, the hard times for the industry and now that things are booming, they want their share of the profits. Uh, and this is actually a layer of workers that voted very strongly for Trump, they're quite right wing. But when interviewed, some expressed that if Trump didn't ex support this, uh, the strike, and they actually really expected him to support the workers in the strike, if, they, if he doesn't support the workers, they're gonna completely change how they look at Trump. So we can expect that. <laughs> um, so if you look at this, we have two promising trends developing in the US, with one, on the one hand, a development of a new, clear, and expanding socialist consciousness, especially among youth. I have to actually offer an anecdote. I was just sent uh, yesterday a picture from my friend who is organizing student walkouts right now. They're a teacher in Seattle. And there was a middle schooler uh, he teaches, and this is before the walkout. And this, uh, this 11 year old boy, uh, they were having just like a drawing exercises, they're making art, you know, there's no political prompt. What he made was just a sign that said the only place workers and bosses can get along is in heaven. <laughs> it's just like, this is an, you know, it's incredible. This is an 11 year old you know, child, the class consciousness among like youth, especially like really young youth in the US, it's just, it's just skyrocketing. Um, so I, I really don't have any more time. Just, just, uh, it's okay, you yeah. can take a little close to Five minutes, maybe? I think uh, take two or three minutes. I think it's, it, you can. Okay, I'll go. I, can, I, I see what you see. Okay. So, can so I just, uh, I think it's important to discuss as well some of the fights that Socialist Alternative directly is engaged in, especially in Seattle. Uh, and I think it really demonstrates what a Marxist organization, a fighting Marxist organization can achieve alongside one representative, just as the, <clears throat> the CWI demonstrated what can be achieved with a majority of representatives in the case of the Liverpool City Council in the UK in the 1980s. Um, in our six years in office so far with just one representative, Sham Sawant, it would take another 45 minutes to detail the fights we've engaged in. Uh, the fight for a $15 minimum wage, which constituted a transfer of $3 billion from the richest to the poorest over 10 years. The development of a movement for rent control, stopping the development of the most expensive police station in the US, which was $150 million proposed, and redirecting $27 million of that towards affordable housing, much, much more. And, and most recently, we had a fight that impacted uh, the US at large, which was the fight to tax Amazon and Jeff Bezos, uh, the richest man in the world. He has control of $160 billion. He lives in Seattle, and it seems through this we've made him uh, an enemy of us directly. <laughs> um, Seattle, just to give some background, it has the worst homelessness crisis in all of the US. The, the county Seattle's based in has a population of 2 million people. 12,000 of them uh, are homeless. 6,000 of them have no shelter whatsoever. They sleep just directly on the street. 4,000 of these people are children. Um, and this has developed alongside skyrocketing rental and home prices. There's a, the medium price of a home in Seattle is $750,000. Uh, an average monthly rents for a one bedroom apartment are $2,000. So the city government has declared a state of emergency to deal with this, but they've really done nothing to address this crisis in spite of their, their words. They've poured hundreds of millions of dollars into inefficient programs. Uh, and some of this tax money, it's mostly coming from property taxes that affect the middle class quite heavily. It goes to subsidize private landlords to pay, to give them affordable housing. It's just giving tax money to the private sector basically. Other portions are going to the police to fund what are called sweeps of homeless encampments. What these sweeps do is they destroy the shelters people have built and they throw their personal belongings in the garbage and that's basically all they do. Uh, they just push people around the city and they prevent them from even achieving any stability. Supposedly, they're supposed to bring people into safe city-owned shelters, but there's not enough shelters. 
So we worked over the course of the year to bring together a massive coalition of organizations and fought to pass a tax of $150 million annually on the top 3% of corporations in Seattle to pay for more shelters, but mostly to pay for developing publicly owned affordable housing. Uh, we brought hundreds into City Hall to demand this tax, we occupied City Hall overnight, and we staged a march through the city of hundreds of people. And this council, uh, which has uh, what could be considered only uh, left-leaning Democrats, aside from us, as the only socialist, they managed to compromise this uh, proposal down to $50 million annually, but it did pass, they, they voted for it. But throughout this process, Amazon threatened a, a capital strike. They suspended development of a massive office building which would employ 7,000 people until it was clear if the tax would pass or not. In fact, the cost of leasing this building uh, to some other company would have been more expensive than just paying the tax. So the, it, it shows that the reason Amazon did this is because right now they're currently they're searching for another city to place their second big headquarters. And they're de uh, demanding just unbelievable tax handouts from cities in exchange for this. For example, in Chicago, they arranged it so that if Amazon built their headquarters there, Amazon employees would, have, would pay their taxes directly to Amazon's profits rather than the city government. You know, it really, it, it's incredible. Um, in response to this, uh, this capital strike from Amazon, uh, Amazon, uh, you know, they were communicating directly with the head of the local constructors worker, construction workers union. Uh, this union, you know, they were explicitly saying like the bosses, like what's good for the business, it's good for the workers, like it's a pretty right wing union. And they brought hundreds of construction workers out to protest the tax, because they were saying it was a tax on jobs. When I spoke to some of these people, they had no idea what the tax was, and when I explained what it was, they said they supported it. Um, however, they still protested the tax because they were afraid of being fired if they said anything. And we actually have a member in the Constructions Workers, Construction Workers Union. He wrote a public article in a popular local newspaper in support of the tax, and he actually has faced uh, physical threats to his safety, including uh, death threats. Um, after this tax was passed, uh, big companies funded an effort uh, to put it on the ballot so they could vote it away, and they raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to fly in professional canvassers from around the country. They never actually reported how many signatures they got, but they claimed they had achieved the, the amount necessary, and this gave the Democratic Party and the council the excuse they wanted to repeal the tax, which was, it was a stunning reversal just a few weeks later. Seven of the nine councillors who voted for it now repealed it. So while we weren't able to win this fight, uh, it had a massive impact, though, in demonstrating for millions of people around the country the lengths Amazon and the capitalist class are willing to go to keep their profits. And actually, it has in, is in, uh, inspired an initiative in San Francisco that's virtually identical to our original proposal uh, that may pass this fall. So I'm, I'm really out of time here. <clears throat> I'll just end by saying, in, in spite of all the challenges, the success of Trump pushing forward brutal attacks in some cases, you know, the brazen and open ugliness of the current administration. If you look at the balance of class forces in the U.S., it has some promising developments. And it may be more favorable, in fact, than it looks from the outside. Um, so I believe it's, it's really through our, our common work, the lessons we bring to each other as Marxists, as internationalists at this conference, uh, hopefully that will allow us to avoid building on the left, whether it's in Israel, Palestine, or the U.S. Uh, these lessons can help us avoid as gracefully as we can the, the pitfalls the traps the left has fallen into many times on this road to a socialist society and a socialist world. So thank you for the